Well, no, I said, I'm, you're wrong. I said, it is a, this is a public company in which your family happens to have an interest. Slater came in and made his bid across the, across the uh, table. My father wasn't the slightest bit interested. He just told Slater to go to hell. He wasn't interested. Slater was half his age. My father was a military man or had a military background. And I think he was horrified to think this young man had the audacity to suggest that he might take over court manufacturing. I mean, it was, he was in a way typical of a large number of people running family companies that have become public but still go on treating them as if they are family businesses. I'm just going to pause for a minute because I want to come to tea, if I may. Whereas you were saying what? Well, it, people put money up for the shares, don't they? They expect a reward. Jim Slater then did something that had hardly ever been done in Britain before. He made a hostile takeover. He went behind Colonel Coote's back and secretly began to buy up Cork's shares in the stock market at a very high price. To the city establishment, it was an outrageous and an ungentlemanly act. But there was nothing they could do to stop him. And as Slater bought the shares, he ruthlessly exposed the illusion of Colonel Coote's power. Coote's position as a local dignitary and the respect he and his family received from the workers all came from the belief that he owned the company. And Slater suddenly showed he didn't. To fund the takeover, Slater had borrowed a great deal of money. To pay it back, he immediately sold off large parts of the land and the factories. They were demolished for property development. Slater had invented a formula which he now repeated. The sales of assets from each takeover were then used to fund the next and bigger one. He took over companies that made metal windows, rubberware, car seats, even bedroom slippers. And soon, others began to copy him. A group of takeover men grew up who began to break up the old paternalist world that dominated British industry. The comfortable scene that these people broke in on was too comfortable, was old-fashioned, was uncompetitive, was cartelized and convenient for the people who were running it, needed, needed breaking up, was breaking up. It needed something vulgar like market forces breaking into, the, into it. Uh, that kind of thing is often caused to happen by rather vulgar people. It's not the worst for that. But, of course, I mean, there were some real spivs of different kinds among them. Of course there were. Was Slater a spiv? Yes, I think, I think he was. This is the great room, or the saloon, as they called it in the 18th century. Remarkable room, built in extravagant design. All the panels on the ceiling were painted by William Kent himself and are uh, the love life of the gods of ancient Greece. The social centre for the takeover men was the Claremont Club, a gambling club in Berkeley Square in Mayfair. It was run by a right-wing aristocrat, John Aspinall. He was a ferocious professional gambler, and those he admired and let into his club were people he described as risk-takers. Some people actually seek risk, and they put themselves at risk voluntarily. And I think this is a spirit that is to be admired. I think it's the spirit that built the prosperity that everybody in this country is enjoying today, it was created by adventurers, by merchant adventurers, by pirates, if you like, like Morgan and Drake. 200 pounds, four 200 pounds. Card, please. Eight cards. The other dominant member of the Claremont set was James Goldsmith. He had briefly been famous in the 50s when he had eloped with a Bolivian heiress called Isabel Patino. She later died in childbirth. Goldsmith now became a close friend of Jim Slater's. Jimmy Goldsmith and I were great friends. We used to dine together and play backgammon together very frequently. He was, I think it's fair to say this, better educated, more cultured, from a more cultured background, 
and um, um, more of a bon viveur, really, as well. But in terms of business, we were very similar. We were definitely, for want of a better word, hungry. To the establishment, the Claremont set were a group of destructive gamblers. They were tearing up British industry and fueling a dangerous boom in the stock market. The journalist Paul Johnson wrote, they are squirming social scum, typical of the rottenness that is poisoning British society. But Jim Slater was about to stop being a despised outsider. Politicians were going to turn to him for help and make him an influential force in British politics. There's one basic fact. Labour has a clear majority. We have a Labour government. In 1964, a Labour government had been elected. They came to power promising to create a modern, prosperous Britain. But almost immediately, they were faced with a crisis. The boom that the Tories had begun five years before had gone out of control. British industry simply couldn't cope with the demand created by the boom. The new government faced growing inflation and a balance of payments crisis. They had to cancel many of their election promises and cut spending. I would appeal to people to give the Prime Minister a hearing and not these exhibitionists who follow him from hall to hall. But our old friends return to the purpose of this meeting Everything in our programme has been costed and is included within the programme of our national plan within our tightly controlled and rigidly expanded government expenditure programme for the next five years. Now, we have some very difficult years ahead of us. I hope no one is going to deny that now. The fundamental problem that politicians believed was productivity. If they could make industry more efficient, the economy would grow and Britain would become rich again. What was needed was a quick way to reorganise industry. At this point, Jim Slater emerged as a public figure. He portrayed himself as a new kind of industrial manager. Unlike the old captains of industry, he was not concerned with the national interest. He was only concerned with making a profit. You are, in a sense, a new breed of person in British industry, aren't you? Now, you don't deal with any one thing other than money, really. I mean, that is, in a sense, our product. How do you mean? Well, we are concerned with making money. That is what we, that is what we are trying to do. My, I regard my prime job, if I can put it that way, as a responsibility to my shareholders to provide for them an increasing return per annum on their capital employed. And this, to my mind, is what it's all about. What Slater argued was that he was using the stock market as a tool to reshape industry. He sold off any part of a company that didn't make a healthy profit. What remained automatically became more efficient. And he pointed to his phenomenal growth in profits to prove this. What Slater seemed to have invented was a way of increasing productivity without having to invest any money. He was no longer a wrecker of industry, he was its saviour. And Slater had been seen as a pirate, truth to tell, a trampler of the established order. But of course by this time perhaps it was a good idea to trample the uh, established order, make it leaner and fitter and all the sort of jargon that people put round at such a time. And here also were people who were regarded, and Slater is the classic example, as wizards. They look like agents of industrial reconstruction. And it's worth reminding ourselves that the government of the time, the Wilson government, a Labour government, had an industrial reorganisation corporation going on at the time, actively backing takeovers, having preferred favourites. It's also worth remembering that the minister in charge was Tony Benn. The Labour government copied Slater's methods. Under Tony Benn's guidance, they masterminded massive takeovers and mergers in British industry. Old companies were forced together to make new conglomerates. Upper Clyde Shipbuilders was created on Clydeside, and in the process, as with Slater's takeovers, 